what is he so mad about? I'm not sure. That is, uh, that is a question for today. Okay, well, so um, I am Danny Gregory. This is Draw With Me. You're going to draw with me and lots and lots of our friends here in virtual space. <sighs> As you can see, I am back in New York City, where I have lived more or less continuously since I was 12. But for the last six months, I and my wife, JJ, have been in Phoenix, Arizona. And we just came back a few days ago. Now, normally, as you know, if you're a regular uh, viewer, participant in Draw With Me, we are interrupted by lawn care, leaf blowers, lawn mowers, and obnoxious birds of various kinds. But now we're back in New York City. And instead, we're going to be interrupted by, I don't know, fire engines and tr trucks backing up and obnoxious birds, possibly, too. But uh, it's good to be back here in New York. Um, it's, it's strange. It's unusual. It was six, six months and, I think, four or five days that we were on this extended inadvertent kind of vacation. Yeah, this is like a great vacation that the entire world is on together. <laughs> but I am, I am happy to be here. It's, 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 a, it's a strange experience to be, um, to be back in New York. Uh, I think initially I was very excited to be here and to see the familiar stuff, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, just the energy of New York is amazing. And it's kind of changed. I mean, because New York is not what it was. I mean, I'm sure it will be eventually again, but it is, I'm sure, like your hometown, is uh, transmogrified, transformed by the events of the pandemic. So, um, you know, there are businesses that were here for years that are gone. There are restaurants that uh, are now serving just on the sidewalk, like on every block. Um, most people wear masks most of the time, but it's still... Uh, what was always so great about New York, which is having all these people, is now kind of mm, stress-inducing, slightly threatening, slightly... Mm, Taking, taking some getting used to. So that's one thing. Another thing is I'm back to my home in New York, but um, we are uh, packing up because we are actually going to be moving back to Arizona with all of our stuff. So our stuff is kind of in disarray. Um, our apartment is kind of half empty. My bookshelves are slump, somewhat depleted, but will soon be empty too. And uh, for the next few weeks, we will be packing up and moving out. So... Um, JJ had uh, some ear problem that is sort of under control, and it was certainly under control enough for us to fly. So, all right. For those of you who don't know me, don't care about my travel plans, let me tell you what we're going to do today, and uh, let's do it. So, one of the things that I like very much is this teacup. It's, it's really big. I actually have several different ones. But I love this teacup, and I love to draw this teacup. It is a really interesting and challenging drawing. Not terribly challenging. It's a teacup. It's not, you know, six naked people sword fighting. It's a teacup. Um, but it's, it's a fun, challenging thing to do. So this is what I'm thinking of drawing today. Um, you're f welcome to draw whatever you'd like, but I'm going to make my teacup available to you if you'd like to try drawing it too. And we're going to talk about what it is to draw something that's both simple and complex, how to approach it. Uh, I'm going to draw with probably primarily this, which is a number, uh, an 03 uni pin, which is a um, waterproof pen, which I like. I might introduce a number, an 01. 
I probably might bring in some watercolors later on. I use some colored pencils. So if you want to have some other stuff around too, um, you can do that. And um, I'm going to draw in this, which is my teacup drawing sketchbook. I have a teacup drawing sketchbook. I have a shoe drawing sketchbook. I have an um, uh, airplane drawing sketchbook. I have a dog drawing. I don't. I don't have. I have, I have just had this one, this one thing for teacups because, and I'll show you in a second, I like to draw. I like this, tea, this thing, it happens to be a nice size, and so I started sort of using it to draw teacups in, and it became my teacup sketchbook. Um, it is, I haven't drawn in it. I haven't drawn my teacup in six months. So for a long time, I had a practice of every morning when I would get up, I would put the kettle on to make a cup of tea, and I would draw my teacup. And I would just do that every morning at 6 or 7, whenever it was I got up. And I would just draw the same thing over and over again. And I want to talk a bit about that, about, you know, why would a grown man resort to drawing the same mundane thing day after day? Um, we'll talk a bit about why that's a good thing, too. But in the meantime, um, let us prepare to draw. And... Um, I'm going to switch to this other perspective here, which is, which is my desk. You can see my teacup is over here, but I've also got this little image of a teacup that I wanted to just put here for you to see as well. So you can see clearly and consistently this teacup so that it won't, um, you know, you can just draw from. I'm going to turn it off for a second, though, because I wanted to show you this, this thing. I, you may have seen it before. It is, uh, it's a really nice square sketchbook that was made by my friend Roz Stendhal. Um, and I started this in 2016, and I did it quite regularly and religiously, um, and then I, then I stopped. But I drew this guy over and over. Well, I could just keep saying the word over many times because I have drawn him, or her, or it, mon cherie amour, mon cherie amour, um, over and over again. So, yeah, sometimes with a tea bag, slightly different approaches. The tea bag again, um, you know, sometimes more sh shadows, kind of. Sometimes it's shaped differently, and on. So yes, you know, and each one is sort of indicative of how I was feeling that morning. You know, sometimes the teacup is a little small. Sometimes uh, it's got his back towards us. Um, sometimes I make a mistake. And it's true, JJ, I do love tea. In fact, my son, Jack T. Gregory, was named after tea because I love tea. So there's tea, tea. Yes, deckled edge. Really nice thick paper. I don't know if you can see it. It's like this is, this is really nice. I mean, I sometimes feel bad that I just did pen drawings on it. So that's why I'm going to do a watercolor. I've never done a watercolor in here before, but I've got a blank page ready to go. I'm going to take another little sketchbook and put it underneath so that it's kind of flat. And let's get going, guys. Oh, no, I know what I wanted to talk to you about. I wanted to show you one thing before we begin drawing this teacup. So if you are drawing it, fine. Well, you aren't because you don't have the picture. But I wanted to talk a bit about negative space. Because the thing about this teacup is it is a relatively complex thing. It is also somebody else's piece of art in the, you know, we're drawing a, an object, but we're also copying somebody else's art. And it is complicated, and so we want to, you know, just think about how do we approach this, you know, because we're drawing two things at the same time, a cup, but then we also have like three-dimensional cherries, and it's all a pattern. So, um, oh, no, good, I got my book wet. So while that's drying, I, so I want to show you, I, I took a picture of this cup, as I showed you, and I wanted to break it down to sort of explain... Um, how to look at the negative space of this cup and how using negative space can help you to, you know, to think about complexity. So um, what, I've, what I've got is I, I put 
this picture into Photoshop. Don't worry about the fact that it's Photoshop. That's not really important. But what is important is that it's kind of a, uh, a way of just breaking down these layers. So let's check this out. All right, so here's our cup. And as you can see, this white counter that it's sitting on is a shape. It is a piece of negative space. In fact, to make it clear, let me just show you, if we make it super white, you can see it is a single shape all the way around. And then there's a little tiny shape inside the interior of the handle. Let me show you, let's make that black so you can see it even more clearly. There it is, a black shape. Now let's get rid of the cup and just look at that shape by itself. So you can see it's, it is, the white is a shape, the black is a shape. But let's just look at this white and see, there's some interesting things about it, right? That when you, that when you look at the cup, you see the cup going all the way down almost to the bottom third of the, of the image. The bottom of the cup is about a third of the way down the image. But when you actually look at where the saucer is hitting the side of the cup, it's actually really high up. And so you get a completely different shape than you might first have perceived. Also, you can see that the handle, which looks like a relatively large and somewhat complicated shape, the negative part of it is just basically a, a circle with a flattened side. So that is simplifying uh, the edges and the outside shape and the proportions as well, because you can see that the width of the saucer and the height of the cup and the saucer are about the same. So that helps you to, again, gauge how big this is you can also look at how, what the shape of the, of the bottom is, how it's an oval or football shape, and not a circle. So all those kinds of things help you to get your bearings and help you to eliminate the uh, perception that you have about what you think a cup looks like, or what you think a circular saucer actually looks like. Um, now let's look at the negative space contained within this uh, saucer, right? So the, the saucer that has these flowers, obviously, and cherries and leaves, but there's also a white shape, and it's actually a fairly large shape that occupies most of this image. So if we were just to look at just that, it would look like this. I've blackened the white so you can see it clearly, but that's one single shape right there. It looks like this. That's one, one uh, continuous shape that is defining all of that white. We're not worrying about shading or anything like that, but just looking at that white, you can see uh, that it becomes one shape. And then there are, in addition, there are some other small white shapes that sit like between the stems uh, of the cherries and so forth, and that's kind of like that. So again, if we take that away, we see, oops, we see that there's one continuous shape, and that's really helping you to see the whole cup. Right? You, you're really getting a good sense of it. Um, so without getting too involved or too overwhelmed by all these cherries and leaves and all that stuff, you could just focus on drawing the outline of the entire thing. And there's one more uh, shape that we want to look at, which is the circle at the top. The flat, the, again, another football shape, the oval um, of the top of the cup. Again, it's not a circle, it's an oval. And then we compare that with the bottom get rid of the cup here and you can see that that circle of the the oval of the top of the cup and the oval of the saucer are pretty similar again a reminder that the bottom of this rounded object is not flat it's rounded and then when we put all these pieces together there we have a pretty clear definition of this cup and if you think about it if you if you had this shape if I handed this to you already drawn it would be relatively easy for you to go in and fill in those cherries, fill in the flowers, fill in the leaves, you'd have a lot of guidance already figured out for you. So that's one of the advantages of negative spaces. If you're really confused as to where things lay, you can just simply look at the negative space. In this case, just look at the white of this, of this shape and you will see the cup emerge magically. That's the positive aspect of negativity negative space. It's also known as trapped space because 
these little shapes are trapped within other shapes. Trapped space. Yeah, tra trapped space. So um, don't let that overwhelm you. Forget it if you want to. But I think I just brought it up because I think it is sometimes helpful to have uh, just this as a guide. Like when you get when you get stuck and you're like, uh, I don't, I don't know how to deal with the shape of the handle. I don't know how to deal with the curve of the of the of the cup and the pattern and how the pattern is bending. Don't worry about that. Just look at the negative space. Stop thinking about what it is. It's a curved space with cherries painted on it. No, it's shapes. It's all shapes. That's what everything is. We live in a universe of shapes. So if you can break them down, you can simplify them. And a really complicated thing just becomes a series of shapes. Draw one shape, draw the shape next to it, the shape above it, the shape below it. Eventually, you will magically expand. So, um, so there's that. All right. So let me, uh, let's go back to the desk and let's, um, let's get that cup back here. All right, so there's our cup, and are you all ready to to try it out? Get this all sorted. Okay. This situation with this floating <laughs> teacup next to my sketchbook looks like I could just sort of magically take it and uh, magically move it into my sketchbook and flatten it. Anyway, um, but I can't. I'm going to have to draw it, and I will. I look forward to it. All right, here we go. So, you know, I almost always start on this upper left corner because I'm right-handed. And, um, you know, take my time. This part here, this curve, it is in some ways the scariest, scariest um, part of doing this kind of drawing because you just don't know, like, how long is it supposed to be? But, again, you could use negative space, theoretically, because you could, you could say, you know what, I'm going to... Um, I indicate this. You know, I'm going to look at where this cherry intersects. I mean, I, c I could look at landmarks on the cup and use those to help me kind of determine how far along of the journey I am. But this is the other, even more scary part of this. In fact, I'm going to try and draw it in two pieces. Okay, so that's kind of it. And um, now I'm going to just draw that inside bit of this handle. Now this handle, as you can see, is not consistently thick. It's thinner here. And then it gets wider here because the handle is a bit wider, but also we're seeing a bit more of it. And then it gets a bit thinner, comes down, meets the continuation of that saucer. It's actually a little bit more like that. So screwed it up already. All right. So now I'm going to just go in and I'm going to start filling in these other bits. So I now have this guide. I can say, okay, this comes down here and I'm inside. I'm now inside the kind of line that goes all the way around it. I'm actually seeing, um, but I can see, I can see where I have to go because it's just a little short piece that I have to make now to connect that handle. And now that I've done that handle, I can see where the side of the cup is and it's basically kind of there, which is interesting, right? Because you think that where the cup joins wouldn't be right at the edge, uh, but it is right now. So, and I can come down and do this bottom bit and I can do this part and um, sort of see if I can make them connect. I can already see that it's wonky. It's already getting wonky, but uh, that's okay. Yeah, this is this is more curved than I've made it, but 
yeah, so my teacup is, uh, you know, it's already, it's already doing its own dance, but that's okay. I'm going to now try and do, to do this internal bit. And, um, okay. And there's also kind of an edge to this whole thing that is actually kind of a useful fact because it allows me to kind of just make this feel a little bit more round because there's this sort of slight lip on it. And yeah, okay. Um, so now I'm going to draw inside these negative spaces. I can start to draw like this little cherry that's sitting here just underneath the handle. And I can give it a bit of a stem and there's a little tiny piece of leaf there. I can do that. And then I can look at, there's a leaf here that is sort of going across. So I'm just, now that I have this whole kind of perimeter figured out, um, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm not really overly concerned about the fact that this thing is a little bit, um, you know, skewed. It's okay because it's all going to be equally skewed. So it'll just look like I meant to do it, even though I didn't. <laughs> I meant to draw this perfectly. I missed you, teacup. I'm sorry to do this to you. But then this teacup is used to it. I've done this kind of distortion to it many times before, and it doesn't seem to mind. It's, it still does its job of providing me with libation periodically. Well, by periodically, I mean every day. Sort of on a bit of a coffee jag for a while, but now definitely tea is my thing. So, and I'm going to draw this other leaf. And there's just like the hint of a cherry back here. So you see, it's, again, it, it's what seemed like a really impossibly complicated thing. By breaking it down into these little sections, it somehow becomes conceivable. This is the sort of middle bit of that flower, kind of purplish flower there. And then there's this one leaf up there. There's another flower back here. And then there's a little bud over here. But again, I'm, I'm, I mean, I've, I've drawn this in many different ways. Like I've drawn it by drawing just the pattern first and then drawing the outline of the cup just to mess with my head. And I've also drawn it um, like just scanning from one side to the other. But here's why I would bother doing this. Like why bother drawing the same thing? I mean, who even wants one drawing of this teacup, let alone an entire book of them? Well, I'll tell you what was on my mind. A few things. The simplest thing was I was waking up still groggy, having a few minutes to kill while I sat there waiting for the kettle to boil and then waiting for my tea to steep and then waiting for it to cool down to be potable. All these things take time that I was just sort of, I could spend staring out the window, but um, I find it difficult to just do that. So it was like a simple thing, but I also, because I was still sort of half asleep usually, I didn't really want to think about like, well, what am I going to draw? So this is a sort of a simple thing. There's my book. I would always keep this book sitting by the um, kettle. So I always knew where it was. It would remind me, hey, time to draw, dude. And also, it was, um, you know, my subject was right there. I didn't have to think about it. I would just say, okay, I'm just going to draw. It's kind of like reflexive in the way that you are first thing in the morning. You know, making a cup of tea is reflexive, and um, so is brushing your teeth or whatever. You know, it's like it's all kind of hardwired into you. And the idea of having drawing being hard, hardwired into me is... is uh, you know, is, is really interesting and good, I think, good. 
So that was one, one reason for doing this on a regular basis. Another reason was when you do something consistently, you reveal the things that have changed. Right? It's, we all change every day. I change a lot. And by having a kind of a simple benchmark, which is I'm going to do this exact same drawing at basically the exact same time in exactly the same way, I was more aware of what the differences were, the changes in me, which is an interesting, to me, an interesting part of drawing is sort of the um, fact that it is a diary of kind. Not a, not a sort of dear diary, today Bobby was mean to me and pushed me over in the playground kind of diary, but sort of like a, just a record of who I am and what's happened. You know, something that you can look back on and you can almost fast forward and see the changes in your psychology, in your sort of view of the world, in your moods, all those kinds of things, um, but done in a way that is nonverbal and sort of subtle. That's one of the things that I really love about having an illustrated journal instead of having just a written diary, is that it's just a more complex way of tracking and, and you know your feelings, and you know it's not just. I mean, I've seen people like have numerical scales. How do you feel today on a scale of one to ten? What's your mood? What's your intelligence feel like today? Do you feel sharp? All that kind of stuff. Um, again, really subjective. Masquerading is objectivity, objectivity, but also um, not a lot of fun. And I, I don't think terribly accurate, despite its scientific appearance. Um, but this consistent thing, just, I don't know, another way of recording it. Like the familiar, the things that are familiar that we take for granted, when you study them with drawing, you often will find that they're actually kind of different when you're seeing things that you didn't, that you may have overlooked. Which is the thing that strikes me in coming home to New York after being away for a while, which is being aware of the changes in the city and the changes in me and how I've changed. It was, you know, so again, looking at the things that are sort of familiar and sort of similar, but also seeing them differently because time has passed. You know, so, you know, I don't think you need the novelty of like constantly drawing new things. This teacup is really enough to keep me busy and occupied for a long time. See, I also just realized that I really thought that this space here, I had made it too narrow. But now I realize that actually I made it too wide. So it's good. So this is my, so my teacup is like relatively good, relatively um, correct. Normally, as you can see in the past, I would, I would start cross-hatching. Should I do that or should I bring in some watercolors? No, I think I need to be consistent. I need to be consistent. So I'm going to continue with this pen. And I'm just gonna, just gonna hatch, add tone with lines. So I've always done it. You know, I don't want to have this book that suddenly has some stupid watercolor in it. What's that watercolor doing in there? Oh, uh, I was on YouTube doing draw with me, and I just kind of thought I'd do it. Well, you ruined it, dude. You ruined it by being inconsistent. Although, of course, foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. I'm not sure who said that. Hobgoblin, which is a fantastic word, of small minds. Foolish consistency. That's not to say that consistency is wrong, but being foolish about it is. So, you know, again, the idea behind this is not to be you know, really super rigid, like I must do this in a certain way. It's really more to just say, you know what, how do we keep things similar so we can go deeper? You know, you don't have to go far, you can go deep instead. And uh, that, that's really rewarding sometimes.
So. Cross-hatching is just such a pleasure. It's meditative, it's calming, rhythmic, mindless in some ways, mindful in other ways. So I can decide to make these cherries feel round by curving my lines, or I can make them feel flat by just keeping my lines flat. And I can try and keep get a different texture out of the leaves because to indicate that they're a different color. I mean, I might decide, you know what? Some of these leaves, from a tonal point of view, pure black and white point of view, are actually much darker than the cherries, and some are lighter. So do I want to maybe indicate that by having deeper, heavier lines, closer together? Um, or do I don't want to just be kind of all the same value? I think in general, drawings are more interesting when the values change. Unlike politicians, drawings are enhanced by shifting values. Um, So what I've been doing so far is I'm just doing the kind of local colors, right? I'm just saying, this is red, this is green, I'm going to color it in. But I'm not really looking much, besides this part, I'm not really looking at the effect of light on this teacup. Like, where is it darker? Where is it lighter? Now, these, these individual cherries have a little bit of shading on them, right? If you look at them, a little bit of shading. There's darker parts, there's lighter parts, there's a bit of variation. Um, great. Um, but also, the teacup itself is a three-dimensional object, and so light is hitting it and making things change. Yeah, and it, it is kind of amazing, and I haven't drawn this in a while, but nonetheless, it is kind of interesting that it is still interesting. The shape is complicated enough that um, it is still interesting and full of challenges. I don't feel like, okay, I know exactly how to do that. And here's another thing I could do, is I could decide that I'm going to use stippling to indicate shading like to indicate the effect of light. So rather than just, so lines could represent the patterns. And I could say, you know what? I'm going to add light and dark to this object by doing stippling. Stippling is just little dots. You want to try and make your stipples, though, you know, in rows or consistent. You don't want to just sort of put pimples all over your thing, because then it will look like mistakes rather than indicating tone. Um, but if you are kind of consistent about it and you put them sometimes closer together to indicate darker areas and sometimes further apart to indicate lighter part, lighter areas, um, then it will work effectively. You can also hug the curves of the handle and that will give you, um, you know, a sense of it being rounded. So they're not, they, don't, they can go up and down, but they could also go around and curve. Um, I'm doing this bit faster than I should, so it's not quite as smooth as it should be, but um, I mean, what could be more boring than using the power of the internet to watch a man make little tiny dots on a piece of paper? This is, this is the age we live in. This is what passes for entertainment.
in these dark days. Next week we will watch Watercolor Dry. Which is actually quite fast moving. You should watch Oil Paint Dry. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, I've completely forgot to draw this. I wonder, no wonder this looks kind of empty. I just I didn't draw any of these leaves. You know, what what was I doing? Where was I? Lord. What a gaff. This is, it's, this is nice to do, and I do feel like, you know, it's kind of erasing the last six months in some ways to just sit and re-experience this habit. Another, another benefit of, of doing this on a regular basis, right, is I have this to come back to, to say, that's what I like to do. This gives me this feeling. Doing this over and again gives me this feeling. If it doesn't give me this feeling all of a sudden, what's changed? You know, because I think art is a journey. It's not a destination. We think of it as a destination. Oh, I want to hang that drawing on the wall. I want to do a drawing of a teacup so that I can send it to my friend or so that I can make prints of it or t-shirts out of it and sell it on an Etsy store. Or you can say, I enjoy the experience of doing this. And I'm getting something out of it in the, in the, in the immediate present because it's calming and focusing. But also I'm getting something out of it on the journey because I am moving in a new direction. I'm moving deeper in this direction of learning more about how to do this, and I like that, and that is of value to me. We were talking last night, in fact, to somebody who was saying that they had never really done a portrait before, um, but then they decided to do a portrait of all their grandchildren, to draw a drawing of all their grandchildren to give them as a present. She'd never done a portrait before, and she was miserable doing it. She hated doing it. They were pretty happy with the result, I think, but she found it nerve-wracking. And I said to her, man, that's like, that's like saying, you know what, I've never boiled water before, but I'm going to cook Thanksgiving dinner for everybody this year. It's like, that's a crazy thing to take on. Why did you, you know, why did you put so much pressure on yourself? And she said, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really realize what, what it was about. And people knew that I was drawing. So they were like, hey, you're drawing? Could you do a portrait of the entire family, maybe in oil on black velvet that maybe is like six feet tall and uses mainly blue, so it'll go with that new couch of ours? Could you? Yeah, we'd need it next week. Yeah, that'll, that'll suck the fun out of it. You know what? I'm done. I'll leave this cup up here, though, just in case you want to still see it. Where is it? There it is. All right. I'm gonna. I'll put it over here. No, I'll leave it over there. I'll move. Over. I'll move. All right. There's the cup. If you want to keep drawing it. Um. I want to say a few other things to you before we wrap this up in the next couple minutes. One thing I want to say to you is, if you're a member of the schoolyard at Sketchbook School, you can, uh, I'd love to see your, your cup drawings, 
please share them there. If you're not and you're on social media, um, please put this hashtag on your drawing. Post it. Say hashtag SBS draw with me. If you want to tell people that you drew it with me here, great, cool. Um, but yeah, that way we can all see. It's, it's really great to see lots and lots of teacups, right? To see lots and lots of drawings of the same thing all together, to be able to compare. It's really fun. Um, and that kind of thing is, you know, just keeps you drawing, you know, and you don't have to go like, oh, mine sucks. Theirs is so much better. It's not. It's all different. We're all different. We all draw differently. We all see differently. We all have different degrees of experience. All those things don't matter. What matters is just doing it and having fun doing it. So you, and if you have fun doing it, you do more of it. And if you do more of it, you get more confident at it. It feels easier. You see more clearly. So I would say do that. Um, what else? Every Friday, I write this thing called Danny's List. It's not a very good name, but it is basically an email that I send you. It's thoughts, ideas, diatribes of one kind or another. It's complimentary. All you need to do is to go to sketchbookschool.com slash Danny's hyphen list. Go there, put your name in, and tomorrow I'll send you a little essay that I've written. And uh, this afternoon I have to actually write it, but I will. <laughs> Amazingly, for however long I've been doing this, I've never missed one yet. Having said that, of course, Jinx. But anyway, so sketchbookschool.com slash Danny's List. That's one thing. Another thing is, if you don't really like to read much more than a, a sentence or two, not that my emails are that long, they're not that long, but if you really are, if you feel that brevity is in fact the essence of wit, then text me. Text me at this number, 919-298-8117, and I'll text you back every day. Not every day. I don't want to promise anything, but on a regular basis, I show you what I've been drawing. I show you what, what I've been, what I've found that I think is interesting. I share little links to stuff, recommendations, and uh, if you want to say something to me, I'll see what you say and I'll write back. So you can text me at this number. Uh, it works. It's really me. You can actually do it. Uh, Barack Obama does it. I just found out yesterday. So if he can do it. Yes, I can. I can do it, too. So, uh, I, can't, I don't know what his number is. I haven't texted him yet, but maybe I should to say, Barry, maybe you want to text me back, too. If you're not busy, I'm sure he's not busy these days. Semi-retired like many of us. So, All right, so there's that. And uh, so, yes, text me, you know, Danny's list. Let's leave it at that. Yes, I'm sorry, it's true. You can only do this in the United States, the texting thing. Email, global. Maybe even interglobal. If you're living on another planet, you're receiving this, I may still be able to email you. But texting right now, that may change. So, um, yes, so that's it. And otherwise, meet me here again next Thursday. If you text me and you sign up for my texting list, I'll send you a reminder. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube will send you a reminder. Less trouble, less work for me. Either way. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, we have a great workshop coming up next, not this weekend, but the following weekend. It's called Cooking Up Ideas with Sally Swindell. Do you ever have a thing where you're like, uh, can't think of anything, or oh, I feel like I'm just doing the same thing over again. What Sally will do is in a couple hours, show you some really amazing techniques to, to create visual ideas. And she will help you create, I think, at least 100 ideas in a couple hours. You can find that else at sketchbookschool.com. You can sign up for our thing there. All right, that's enough. Um, yes, Morgan is texting here or putting some stuff up that gives you more information about that. But um, I am looking forward to seeing you in some, either some other form or this form. I'm looking forward to seeing your drawing or not seeing your drawing. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. That would be really nice. Okay, thanks for joining me and my teacup. I'm gonna go back to finishing my hatching and uh, make myself a new cuppa. See you later, bye-bye.